I'd like to thank everyone for attending. Uh, if you looked at the abstract on the website, you probably noticed that there was several speakers. Uh, we've had a few of them. One of them had to bow out due to uh, political complications with his uh, work. Uh, there was a tendency to believe that this presentation might have some information that was sensitive, that, that they simply uh, violated, say, code of ethics just to talk about. Uh, but the message will be spread. Um, we have with us today uh, Sean Barnum, cybersecurity principal, and uh, Chris Peterson from AppSec from Zynga. And uh, so what we're going to be talking about today is the various ways in which you can abuse uh, essentially the Facebook API through the gaming infrastructure and how this can be used to do cyber bullying, play, you know, play practical jokes, but also do some serious things. Uh, the final note I'd say about it is we discovered this research I did through prowling around, uh, and I have some families that are completely addicted to Yeovil, and they were getting attacked, so I just started digging into it, and one thing led to another, and it turned it out to be, you know, what I thought to be a topic uh, worthy of talking about. Um, a couple of disclaimers, though. One, we're not going to be hitting you with uh, some brand new type of attack that's just going to blow your mind. Um, rather, this is more akin to if someone has skill with a man-in-the-middle proxy, that malicious intent, uh, this will show you a wide range of things they can do. So what we're talking about is that the damage that you can do with basic skills um, and the malware and the structured attacks you'll see later on that will show actually originated out of the Philippines in February uh, of this year. Okay. Oh, and finally, we're not here to bash Zynga or Facebook. Um, we're just actually showing attacks that are actually happening. And in the uh, remediation section, where we'll talk about solutions, you'll actually uh, see some work that's been going on that's proactive to defend against the things that we're talking about. So um, first, I'd just like to show you on the very basic idea that uh, down on the farm, I'm growing the good stuff. Believe me, I have a great farm, and I'm growing the OG Kush. So um, uh, no one can touch my Farmville pad. Um, this is actually where I grow it in my pad. Uh, but more important, the little shot you see, this is from Yeovil. Um, and Yeovil has a, pop, a meager population, you might say, of 8.8 .8 million unique users per month. Uh, the total Zynga population of games that are out there, 254 million unique users per month. So we're not talking about a small user population. As you can see, that's enough people that it gives an incentive for phishing and all kinds of different attacks that might prey on people who aren't cybersecurity experts, who are in a position to um, trust what they see. And we're also going to talk about the reasons for the, why that trust exists in several slides. Um, I'd really like to thank Chris for being here with us today. Uh, when we brought this matter to his attention, uh, he was very gracious. We had several email discussions. He was already aware of it. Uh, there was already a solution in the works. The security fix has been developed by Facebook, and uh, Sean's going to talk to you more about that toward the end. Um, the Facebook application API can still be abused, and we'll also tell you why, um, and perhaps things that may happen in the future to make that more difficult. Why should you care, right? <clears throat> Do any of you out there play games on Facebook? Mafia Wars, Secret Delight, don't want a minute? Okay. Uh, <laughs> well, <that's, clears throat> there are, here are some statistics that show you the extent of the penetration of these games. There's currently over 80,000 apps on Facebook, uh, any number of which could be uh, potentially malicious. Social gaming, 1.6 billion this year, uh, projected market cap of over 15 billion by 2015, so that's pretty significant. Um, 300 million people in July is a lot. Now, one trend to realize is it's not just people playing on their PCs, but it may be people playing at work, or it may be people playing on their PDA, and all these things become new attack vectors for you. So what you're going to see is there's going to be instances where someone's mobile device is compromised because of uh, uh, a social game. And this, is, uh, this can be a huge market for the underground. 
Um, on a side note, I have a friend who was basically the, the, the going value of malware on the underground related to these things. He was offered $15,000 if he would write a piece of malware for uh, these purposes. Of course, uh, the, the most important point is social gaming is going on on the networks you're trying to protect. So everything you're doing, however you're locking down your infrastructure, you've probably got someone out there gardening at least uh, planting seeds and waiting, you know, and going to collect them later. And uh, this is happening on your network. And so it can it actually inadvertently become a way of compromising the network and getting access to the inside. So I think these are a number of reasons why you really should care what's going on. Here's the roadmap we're going to take you. This was our brief introduction. We're going to talk about client-side trust attacks within application APIs. Uh, a number of attack patterns against social network gaming. And these attack patterns are really generalized. Sean will speak more to them. Uh, and they are, they are general patterns of attack that, that go beyond Facebook or any Facebook applications, but can relate to any site where you have an application framework and an app within an app. Uh, some of our impact sections, we'll use Yeovil as an example. Uh, that's just one site that I was very familiar with and had family playing, and so I was sort of uh, just focusing on that. Um, and then lastly, most importantly, we're going to tell you how to keep your software off the stage. All right, Chris. So um, thank you, by the way, for allowing me to do this with you guys. Uh, <clears throat> I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the reasons for these issues that they've, that they've discovered in the network. Uh, and it's easy to sort of jump to the conclusion that it's just a bad architecture and that they've made some kind of fatal flaw in how they architected the system and that's what led to these particular issues being there. But the reality is that it's a very complicated system that's been created and there's multiple trust domains that are interacting with each other here. You've got the trust that the user has with the application framework itself, in this case Facebook. You've got the trust that the user has with the application itself, in, in this case Yeovil. And then you've got the trust that goes on between the application and the framework, so between uh, our Zynga applications and Facebook, for instance. And all of those various trust relationships are sort of distinct from each other, and, and the protocols and techniques that have been designed are, are specifically designed to protect the various uh, trust boundaries. So in some of the techniques that you're going to see later in the presentation, there are attacks going on against uh, the uh, man-in-the-middle communication between the client and the application framework, and it seems like the obvious solution would be to just have the application itself send those messages directly to the back end of the framework and eliminate this whole scenario. The problem is that the application framework is actually responsible for protecting the privileged uh, operations that the user is doing. And so the, the, these transactions need to originate from the user so that uh, the, the framework can validate that, in fact, this is a user operation that they've authorized. So that leads to some of these issues. Now, as you'll see towards the end, they've actually done some stuff to improve this, but fundamentally the architecture is not flawed, it's just a very complicated relationship going on. Um, another thing that you'll see in some of these is that there's a lot of uh, uh, trust that's been placed in the client side of, the, of these uh, operations between the application, uh, say Zynga servers, and the Zynga client side application. And there's a reason for that as well. You know, as you saw earlier, our games are huge. Uh, we've got hundreds of millions of users playing every month, and in order for us to scale like that, we've got to push uh, at least a large part of the, uh, the processing of the game logic down to the client side. It's really the only way that we can scale with that size of, of user base. Um, the, some of the other things, though, that they've seen that, uh, that are related to this, why this threat is so large, uh, we've got a uh, the ubiquity of this uh, across the network. So there's hundreds of millions, by the latest estimates, 500 million users using Facebook, 80,000 applications in Facebook itself. There's other social networks doing the same thing. Uh, these client-side apps are everywhere. They're becoming an interesting avenue for people to look at. Uh, our users... Uh, unfortunately, also have a incentive. They've got a profit incentive to to go into the games and, and respond to requests from other users and accept invitations, and that makes them somewhat vulnerable to attack. It's one of a big area of research that we do at, at Zynga, uh, which is part of the social network interaction. And what we're seeing is that uh, these represent an economy, a uh, large economy. As you saw this year, virtual economy and social games is going to be on the order of $1.6 billion. Uh, 
projected to grow 10 times that much in the next five years. And so there's a lot of people out there that see this as an opportunity uh, for them to get a piece of that pie uh, illegitimately. And so we're seeing a lot of malicious activity. We're seeing a lot of people trying to build black market economies around the games. So that's one of the reasons why this is a big area of research that's going on. Okay, so um, I want to talk a little bit about how the actual application framework uh, operates uh, and what's going on. <clears throat> so the client app actually gets uh, downloaded from the game servers uh, when the user instantiates the game. It actually gets loaded, in most cases, into an iframe running inside the Facebook canvas. Uh, but that actual, in our case, Flash application talks directly to our back-end servers through our own API, and most of our interactions are through those servers. But occasionally, when we're invoking activities that involve the social network, such as sending invitations to other users or posting messages on, on someone's wall or something like that, then we have to go through the actual application framework that's provided by the social network. Uh, and so our back-end servers will initiate that, that uh, operation through the client, and the client actually sends that message through that framework interface, and that's what initiates requests into the stream publishing, uh, can access information about user profiles and friend lists and things like that. Uh, and so that's how these two APIs work. They're independent of each other, but they're uh, also coupled. So I'll start off by apologizing for sounding like a frog. This week has been harsh on my voice. Um, just wanted to, before we dive into some of the attack patterns, wanted to call out explicitly some of the characteristics of this um, social network context and this um, uh, application framework paradigm that kind of lends to it making it more susceptible to, to attack. So first of all is this, this issue of trust. There's an inherent trust inside of these sort of contexts where the attacks are coming from people that are within the circle of trust you've already defined and by doing that you're much more likely to fall for issues, you're much more likely to, to click on things, to understand things in a, in, a, in a naive fashion than you would from things you would be suspect coming from the outside. The second is stealth. So all of these attacks are happening at the application logic layer. This is not your typical web attacks where you're looking at cross-site scripting and stuff and seeing scripts, seeing meta characters. The users are just seeing interactions with the application. They don't have any view below that. So it's a lot harder for them to actually detect whether something's malicious or whether it's not malicious. And lastly is this, this issue of urgency. So one of, the, one of the bullets on one of the slides um, Chris just did was the psychological conditioning that a lot of these social networking, social gaming apps do. It, it kind of drives the user to trust the people who are within their network, and there's a temporal issue there. So sometimes when gifts go out and things go out, the user has to click on them a certain period of time where they go away or they're used up because there's a supply. So there's this conditioning to actually quickly trust and not put as much thought into it. So that sort of conditioning, once again, leads to, to being more susceptible to attack. And then this sort of context also brings with it certain attack perspectives. So one of those is it's very easy to do amplification attacks. Once you actually can compromise one user account, the very short hop tight nature of the social networks means that you can leverage that account to quickly affect the people within their circle of trust. Because then those people you can actually get to and then from those people on. So uh, just like other amplification attacks and networks, this one's even um, typically faster and easier because of that tight hop, short hop nature. Excuse me. Also deception, so this whole idea of, uh, of trust that's in there is absolute fertile ground for anybody doing phishing, right? So it's very easy to actually create these messages, which you're going to see some of the, the techniques for doing these things, that look very real, they come from someone that you actually know and trust, and you're, you're, it's very easy to get somebody to click on a link or click on a button or do something that's going to actually take them somewhere else. In the case of some of the buttons, which Tom ta will talk about, uh, just like some of the Java action type buttons you see in other things, the user, the naive user, many times using these applications, can't just do a mouse over and actually see where it's going to. So it's very easy to do phishing attacks with this kind of stuff. And then lastly, it's very simple to exploit. So Tom said that this, this is not really deep technical foo. Anybody with a Peros proxy and basic knowledge of how web applications communicate back and forth, it's very easy in most of these frameworks now that communicate back and forth to actually create false, completely spoof content or to actually modify content on the fly and do all of these things. It's just inherent in the paradigm that's actually here. Um, we'll talk a little bit about some of the mitigations at the end that are making this a little more difficult. But if you're either building and operating an application framework for something like this or you're building applications to work with it, it really does take careful, proactive thought to think through these issues and address them at a, at a, um, a strategic rather than just a tactical level to actually tackle this stuff. So. The, the framework we're going to use for talking about this stuff today is really focused around attack patterns. 
So attack patterns are generalizations off of certain instances of attack. So we're not going to be talking with here's the exact exploit code for doing something. We're, we're taking a step back and saying there are certain patterns that apply to these sorts of architectures, these sorts of contexts. And anybody with a basic knowledge on how to do software attack can look at these patterns and instantiate that in lots of different ways. These attack patterns actually exist at multiple levels of abstraction as well. So you'll see that the first one we've talked about here is the highest level abstraction, which is API manipulation via man in the middle. So given these sorts of application framework communications, it's very easy to do a man in the middle in our position attack and manipulate the API traffic that's going between the application and the framework or the client and the framework. That sort of high-level abstraction can get instantiated in several different ways. So you can use that same API manipulation to do content spoofing, creating stuff on the fly. You can capture stuff in transit, modify it, modify the integrity of it, or you can actually do replay attacks for this sort of messaging as well, which usually is for um, things like in-game cheating and things like that in the communications. So Tom's going to talk just a little bit right here about um, content spoofing, and then we'll go after that, and we'll go with a few more patterns that are a little bit deeper, and he'll talk about some of those as well. So given, given that you have the ability to uh, basically create content from the ground up, and we'll show you which API elements that you can use to do that, you can actually put something on someone's page that is completely custom. So um, you could create what looks like uh, a new game or a new type of quiz, and it would, uh, it would have a button, and it would have a link to, as you can see, this says, one of your friends thinks you're sexy. Find out who. And there's a click allow button. Now, um, this sort of thing could be linked to any number of different attacks. You could link it to uh, you know, any kind of exploit or malware or any kind of malicious website uh, and uh, go from there. Uh, here's an example of just completely spoofed content that was sent out there. Um, I put the ass of fire in circulation for a while because lonely hearts are burning up in Yeovil. And uh, I, you, know, you can see the button, collect the ass of fire. Um, if some of this is hard to see, we'll make the slides available for download um, at some point. Um, and I'll give you a URL. Now, the important thing to note is that each element within this construct actually has a different API area where you can populate it. So here if you sort of map it, you can see actor and then each of these. Sort of media source href is basically the link to the image that you want to put there. Uh, then you can see that any sort of title like, ooh, the ass of fire would be in template data name. And then the template data name has an href that can be manipulated. Now, also important are the action links so that when you go to collect the ass of fire, you could go somewhere else. Uh, uh, and then, of course, uh, take the user to wherever you want them to go. So with that, the, with that mechanic in place and can be exploited with something like a man in the middle proxy, you can actually begin spoofing any kind of content you want and, and uh, playing merry hell with people. Um, ultimately, content spoofing rests on the attacker's ability to modify message content or make a API calls directly uh, to create arbit arbitrary content within uh, cross-application messages. Um, of course, and the impact can be anywhere from phishing, which is a special type of phishing in this case that we'll talk about, um, enables any kind of social engineering, user harassment, uh, things of this nature. Now, this is, of course, a case of cyberbullying. Um, it's an example of sending someone you don't want, say, a uh, burning cross. Now, notice that I didn't change all of the underlying elements. You can see where this was actually a global um, element that would have populated my wall for mystery keys. But I've just taken out all of the elements, but I left the mystery keys in there so you could see portions of that API that were and weren't used. Now, here's what it looks like from a proxy view, okay? And then we'll go ahead and break this out. But this is basically the sum total of complexity that you're dealing with. So you can see that um, it's not incredibly hard. Each of these are the Facebook API elements that you can focus in on when, say, performing content spoofing. Um, the template data href link, the template data media href link, all of these things can point to other things. You can specify the image with the media source. Uh, now what's important is uh, the action link as well, such as if you go to claim it, then uh, that can take you someplace else. Uh, some of these you can leave 
unaltered, so that if you're trying to create a, you know, a, special, a, a special scenario where if they only click to claim it, it takes them to someplace bad, then that's fine. That way they might not know it's illegitimate just by clicking any other links. Um, in these cases, uh, here is an attack execution flow that basically summarizes what was going on. And Chris talked a little bit about this, but basically, if you're starting from, say, mo modifying the underlying request that you found a set of uh, you found a set of keys, or you found a, a cat in the hat hat for your apartment, <clears throat> or for your avatar, then your client side will let what we're calling Appville know, hey, I found this item. Then Appville will respond, okay, this is great. What we need you to do now is to respond to uh, uh, the framework app and tell them that you found this so that it can publish to its own specific feeds. And then you get a stream publishing uh, request to the framework and it goes wherever its destination is. And we'll talk about where the different types and touch points that you can attack. And then finally, of course, the message is delivered and uh, your attack is resident. Now, in a generic sense, given that we're talking about any kind of application framework where you have uh, a master or framework application controlling the sub-applications and there's communication both within the sub-applications and the master, you can have things like invitations, some types of notifications, hey, X event has happened, these things can be tampered with. There can be user or group specific news feeds. Uh, what you would publish through the stream protocol. Um, individual messages, now what would this be? This would be a gift. This would be me sending you a gift, something like uh, Jeffrey Dahmer or snack tray, or uh, if I were just trying to harass you. Uh, or it could be uh, something uh, less obvious and more insidious. And then there could be some types of global alerts that go on, and all these things you could tamper with as long as the client is bearing the, uh, the, the, the strength of the trust in that relationship. Now, we're going to talk about several attack patterns. Sean, do you want to speak to any of these? Okay. Uh, basically, we're going to talk about navigation remapping and button hijacking is two of the big ones. Uh, and in a CAPEX sense, what you'll find is that exploit injection via API message manipulation and malware propagation are basically going to be hierarchically related to these. But So it really, seven and eight are different types of impacts that you can pull or, pull or pivot off of five or six. And we're going to give you some examples of those. Now, when you're talking about navigation remapping, here we're thinking of, let's say, hyperlinks. And this is where you're just simply changing link destinations. Uh, it can result in any of the things we've talked about. Now, I'll show you just a simple example, a short movie of just, this is really sort of just a humorous thing, where, um, okay. Yeah, I gotcha. It's all right. Now, The user clicks on a Man of the Year award. I know this is hard to see, but we can make these available. Um, and then you have Rick Astley coming right off. So we know it's a bit overplayed, but um, it just gives you a sense that going directly from uh, content that looks authorized with on your, uh, your page in Facebook, that you can get to somewhere you don't really want to be. This is all of the different API, API elements that were used in that. Uh, some of them uh, weren't renamed, but all of them, uh, these are the very specific ones that allow you to uh, conduct that type of attack. This is what the attack ex execution flow looks like. Um, you have an event. Basically, the uh, game application tells you how to respond. You modify it, send it back, and then you can get your malware or your, uh, your link, whatever it is you're, uh, you're trying to do. All right, now with button hijacking, it's the same situation except the, the, basically the destinations are masked and you don't really know what you're clicking on when you're clicking on it. And uh, one of the interesting things is that there is, for example, a lot of, a lot of demand for, uh, let's say, a cute puppy. And you, it really warms you in your heart to be able to click and save a cute puppy and no one really expects the fact that by doing that, they could actually be, uh, uh, getting malware on their system or getting hit by a PDF exploit or something. Um, I've highlighted within the Perostomp just some of the areas. Notice where, where the, it says label except. This, is, this is just shows you where it would populate the button content. 
if you were, it would create a button that would say accept Jeffrey Dahmer snack tray. Okay, so you're actually populating what the button contains, but you won't be able to see where it leads. So. Now, in terms of malware propagation through API messages, this is a little more detailed attack execution flow of what we're talking about. You have first some level of authentication that's going between the user and AppVille, and then of course you have a, an application event and then the application event response that you're modifying. And then you're making a stream publish request. This publish request goes directly to Facebook. Facebook will respond to you and say, hey, it was successful, and then it will put this to wherever the destination is that it belongs, either on the user's wall or uh, as a message to the user and whatnot. Now, um, here's what it would look like, and I was just going to show a few slides, and then we'll show you a movie. Uh, here, Jerry Mathers has updated his pad, and the idea here is that all of his friends may want to come and check out what he's done. Now this situation can be quite different if what's being offered is some rare item that's time sensitive and that the number of clicks determines how, what the lifespan of uh, how long it takes you to claim that item. So things can get used up really quickly. So you can actually have a feeding frenzy going on for people wanting to get into these clicks. So that's why we say it's an amplification attack. Now, uh, has anyone ever, this is, this is basically this type of warning, you can't see it, but it has broken English in it, and it's actually a piece of malware that's been drifting around for quite a while. They made ser several refinements on it, uh, but this is just one example of as soon as you click the link to go see the pad, then what you get is an update, you, you've, you've triggered the malware at that point. So this masquerades itself as an antivirus. Uh, What's actually going on is it's using jQuery and Ajax, and it's dynamically updating this page so it looks like what you're looking at is a view in Windows Explorer of yourself getting a virus scan. Uh, and then at the end, it'll offer you to download it. What's important in this case was that they had modified the malware where uh, no matter what you do, unless you just do a hard reboot, you're going to get infected because it doesn't require you to download anything or any ascent. All of this is just a sidebar uh, to the actual attack that's going on in the background. So actually, let me back up and uh, show you a quick movie. So once again, Jerry's updating his pad. And you'll see very quickly that the malware will start hitting him. Pow, OK, there's a warning that comes up. No matter what you do, now he's involved. And uh, going on in the background here is it's downloading prob possibly through uh, some method of like Java network load protocol or some. It fetches malware that you really have no control over uh, seeing. Uh, so you never really know what happens. If you've closed it out, you don't even think that you've been hit. <laughs> Tom just talked really, really fast and got way ahead of where he was supposed to be. <laughs> um, so one of the cool things about DEF CON um, is kind of the unique mix of people we have here. So at the con and probably in the room, you know, we got everything from black hat hackers, malware authors, botnet operators, leets, lamers, posers, scene horrors, you know, security researchers, vendors, and, but we also have some of the corporate security types, the people that actually have to build and deploy and operate this kind of software and they're worried about doing it, doing it in a secure fashion. So um, our goals for speaking here today was really to kind of raise awareness of how kind of fragile some of these framework, application framework communication mechanisms are, especially within a social networking context. Um, some of the unique things that those bring to the game and because of the nature, the fast nature of this stuff growing, because of the fast nature of how many users are out there, because of some of the unique scalability issues, many times these sorts of things are being deployed and maybe not with as deep a proactive security thought as could be there. So one of the things we want to do is try and um, kind of introduce and raise some awareness for those out there who are having to build apps against these sort of frameworks or who are building these frameworks, some of the things they want to think about from a mitigation perspective and some of the resources that might be available. So really, if you're going to build secure software, if you're going to build software that's resilient, resistant, tolerant to attack, the first and absolute fundamental thing you have to do is understand how it's going to be attacked. If you don't understand what the attacker, how they're viewing it, what kind of techniques and things they're going to do, there's no way you can possibly build it to be secure. 
And unfortunately, a broad understanding of that kind of knowledge of the attacker's perspective really resides in a fairly small number of people's heads. This is not broadly known stuff that's out there. And, and truly, most of those people in the world are here this weekend. So if you look around, you might recognize them. Well, unfortunately, when we all leave, whether it's today, tomorrow, whenever you're going back home, you spread out, we're still greatly outnumbered by the people who are trying to build software. And so there's only so much of our brains that can go around to help them understand it. So to tackle this problem really requires some way to, to capture and share that sort of attacker's perspective knowledge and understanding of these sorts of things we're talking about, what sort of um, uh, perspectives and approaches an attacker would take, what sort of things are vulnerable within the software, not just a vulnerability like within you know, this specific version of, of Microsoft Word has a vulnerability CVE, but what is the thing that building your own software you may do to make it vulnerable to these sorts of things? So to start, I wanted to, we wanted to basically introduce a couple of resources that are available for these types of people who are building and deploying this sort of software. Um, the first one of these is called KPEC, and you heard Tom when he's rambling through said, said KPEC at one point. KPEC is the Common Attack Pattern Enumeration and Classification. This is a resource <coughs> developed by an international community. It's led by MITRE and it's hosted by MITRE, but it has hundreds of different people around the world involved in doing it. Um, basically, it's a collection of attack patterns, so common approaches to attacking software. So it has a sch schema that describes things like a detailed attack execution flow, what an attacker does, how they do it, what sort of skill and knowledge is required, what sort of resources are required, which sort of weaknesses in software do these attack patterns focus on and target. Um, the other side of the equation is another resource called CWE, or the Common Weakness Enumeration. Again, it's an international community um, led by MITRE um, and hosted by MITRE, but involving even a much broader footprint of organizations than KPEC is. Um, both of these are available for free. They're available right now at the URLs that are on the screen there, and they're giving me the slides. Um, KPEC currently holds uh, between three and 400 attack patterns descriptions, and the CWE currently has over 800 weaknesses defined. So there's a lot of great resource knowledge, this basic fundamental yin-yang set of the attacker and the, and, the, and the weakness perspective that form a great resource for people who are looking to build the sort of software, deploy this kind of thing, to look at the kinds of things they should be thinking about, to understand how an attacker would view their software and what sort of things they want to make sure are not there, what sort of security features and engineering they need to put in place to try and actually prevent this stuff. Um, the different patterns that we've talked about here today, these nine different patterns, um, in the next release of KPEC, which will go out in the next couple of weeks here. We were trying to get it done before this conference, but we weren't able to get it out there. But you saw during a few of the slides actually referenced, these patterns will be in the next version, so there will be a full description of these. But once again, this is just nine added on top of like 320 that are there already. Um, the reason it's higher than 320 is there's also categories and views and things that help organize these within cla classification taxonomy so you can understand how they're related to each other. So beyond that, one of the things that KPEC and CW both share is they don't just describe the problem. They actually won't see strive to give prescriptive guidance. Here are the things you can do to make sure that your software is not the one being talked up here next year by not just us, but anybody else. So what are the things that you can actually do? So we wanted to leave you with at least a couple of slides here, a few, few detailed um, elements of prescriptive, prescriptive guidance to avoid the kinds of attacks we're talking about today to help secure these sorts of application frameworks and social networks a little bit. This is by no means an exhaustive list, but these things are some pretty good things that should be involved. So starting out with some guidance that are specific to this talk, so the most egregious things, the most egregious um, attacks that Tom was talking about really are ones where you can not only spoof or manipulate the content of messaging um, with things like the cyberbullying of changing an image and that kind of stuff, but really it's that ability to do phishing, the ability to actually do in URI type exploit injection to do um, malware propagation through those links. Those are the really bad things. And there's been a good first step. We talked about earlier that there's been some, some movement from the time we proposed this talk and then from the time we built the first deck. Um, about a month ago, Facebook released a feature they call Secure Stream Publishing which does um, framework side validation of user, client, user side, client side generated messaging for the URIs. So these sorts of messages that go back and forth, when Tom showed you the image with the little, the little fields in the lower right that are the, you know, they accept those kind of link fields, all of those link fields now, if, if, if an application developer uses this opt-in feature on the Facebook framework side, it will actually validate that the URIs coming through in those links are within the application-owned domain, so it doesn't link off to somewhere else. So that doesn't solve all problems, but that's a pretty huge step to actually making sure this stuff doesn't go off. Now, one of the things to look out for is sometimes that might break your actual application because maybe your application goes to links that aren't inside your domain. And one of the first kind of reactions to many different developers may be, well, let's just build a general redirection. Well, now you just broke the whole feature. 
So you really, the feature's there. Um, one of the key things is it really hasn't been publicized yet all that much. We strongly encourage the people from Facebook, we're not dinging them because they're, they're working towards the right thing, but we strongly encourage them to make sure that all the application developers out there are aware of this feature and encourage them strongly to start using this as a first step towards doing this. Um, as of today, Yovo, which is the application we'll be showing you, and all the other Zynga games have actually fully implemented this feature. So all of their communications with the framework, uh, application framework are no longer susceptible to this sort of link manipulation at least. The framework still has the ability to do image manipulation and the text manipulation of message, although that's a little bit limited to cyberbullying because Facebook does destructive transcoding all images, so there really shouldn't be a way to inject anything through that. At least there's not anything known right now, but like anything, that's only today. Tomorrow somebody will figure out some way to do that. Um, but this really is a really, really great first step, but the key is it has to be used, and right now it's not being used widely, so we strongly encourage its use. Beyond that, there are some different approaches that could actually fully secure that sort of message traffic to allow that the client side can't control or manipulate or generate any of that sort of message content. Um, one of the ways of doing this is using application generate messages with whitelists. So rather than have the client hand the content to Facebook, there's the possibility that the client can say, you know, with any, any, with any application, there's typically not a valid use where the user can generate a magic message of their own. It's usually from a set of known messages. So they could actually put a request in to Facebook saying, what we want is message 24. Facebook communicate with the application vendor saying, hey, they wanted 24. And then the application vendor hands down the content. And now you know that it hasn't been mucked with, it's actually official content, and then Facebook or the framework could publish it. Like with anything, there are some downsides to this. That's, that can involve a significant amount of traffic between face, the application framework like Facebook and the application vendors. So that's the reason it's not being done today. And that's a trade-off that they have decided to make. Um, it may be a valid decision today. Going forward with some of the security issues, it may reach the, some, reach the point where that isn't the case. And there may be some application frameworks other than Facebook where maybe they're dealing with less number of apps and so they can actually deal with that sort of traffic. So this is a much more secure approach, but there are some business reasons why it may or may not be the right decision today. So beyond that sort of specific to the attacks we talked about, there's also some general guidance if you're doing these sort of applications against application frameworks, specifically within a social networking context, that are just good rules of thumb. First of all, if you're a framework vendor, you're a framework operator, you really want to establish and enforce, is the key here, some clear rules for application behavior. So what kind of applications are valid? So all of these things we talked about of protecting the messaging traffic are only going to protect you if you're dealing with a valid, non-malicious app. But the reality is you can actually publish to many of these things a malicious app. And it can have completely validated that the content is coming from you, but if you're doing bad things like phishing, scamming, spamming, all these sorts of things, um, you're still making the user vulnerable. The reality is many of the frameworks, including Facebook, have policies defined for these things, but there's not a whole lot of really proactive um, enforcement of some of those rules. I will say that just this week, Facebook took a pretty um, significant step and they discovered one of their developers was um, had a repeated pattern of this sort of behavior, and rather than just banning an app, they banned that developer from ever publishing anything on Facebook again. So that's a great step on that kind of thing, and just it's, it's better if it's, if it's done in a consistent and wide fashion, which it isn't today. Another thing is to enable granular approach to friends and trust. So right now within these social networks like Facebook, there's only one level of friends. You're a friend or you're not. And there's, you know, that implies all of the possible interpretations of what that trust means. So it would be actually much more effective from a security context if you can have multiple different kinds of friends or different levels of trust. You know, this is a friend that I have on a personal nature. This is a friend I have in a business nature. This is a friend I have playing Yeovil. And that way, if something comes to you from a friend within a certain zone of trust, maybe you're going to put a lot less trust with somebody who's in your Yeovil friend list than somebody you've known for 20 years. Right now, you can't distinguish that. When it comes in, you're going to have to recognize their name and understand it. Some of us who only have a couple hundred friends, maybe that's okay. Some people who have a couple thousand friends, that's just not going to be possible, really. So better granularity is going to actually lend to supporting better security structures going forward as well. Um, instituting a mechanism to convey the trustability of applications. So Facebook has a basic capability of that right now where a given application on, their, on the application page, users can go and say, like, I like this application. That's really the extent of the trustability right now. The reality is most people who use Facebook and they use apps, they're typically going to click that like because they think it's a cool application, it does something fun. They're not clicking like because of its security. So that really is not all that great of something, but you know, having mechanisms like some of the e-commerce sites like Amazon and some of those things have right now where there's a little bit more than just like, but you can actually make some security qualifications, 
it'd be a good idea to work some of that in so that when a user actually sees an application that they want to use or they see traffic from that application from one of their friends, they can make some trust decisions. Part of that also is, uh, is um, education of the users to actually understand some of these things. Um, next one is employing clear and visible uh, measures to expose message spoofing. So right now, Facebook, has, and once again is the example, when a message comes through from an application, the lower left it has a little icon, a little thing that indicates that's generated at the framework level for that application, what application it is. So the user who's spoofing a message currently can't spoof that, although they can do near homographic attacks. So instead of Yobill, maybe they could do yo Dashville, and you're not going to notice. But maybe a little bit better structure to, so that a user, when they glance at a message, will know that it's official or not. Maybe structuring a header, things like that. Because right now it's pretty easy to spoof content and only an educated user or somebody who's really looking out for it is going to notice that it's not there. It's not there. Um, part of that, once again, is, is user education. Safebook recently added a page on safety. Um, you know, Facebook safety is describing some of this stuff. You really have to be proactive and go find that. So finding ways to actually make this stuff more evident to the general user who may not be security savvy is a very good idea. Then lastly, the, the last one here is establishing proactive processes of vetting apps that actually get into the framework. So are they malicious or not? So this is the kind of thing that Apple gets dinged for sometimes on how restrictive they are for what goes into the, uh, the application store. But they actually do think about, now they don't test anything, but if they know things are malicious, they might keep them out. Right now, most of the social networking frameworks are fairly open game. Unless you've been banned by name, like this one um, pen cake who was done this week, typically you can throw an application in there and there's not really a proactive vetting process to know that you're a valid application just building a fun little game or you're somebody who's building some sort of a phishing page, phishing application, or try, anything like that, or any kind of malicious um, software download. I mean, it, it could be that the, the Flash client that's actually downloading for the application itself is full of malware. And right now it's pretty easy for anybody to actually install one of those into the um, Facebook framework and actually have people start using it. So we would strongly recommend a, a much more proactive approach to that. So I think that's all that we had for the, the guidance. Um, so last little bit is, you know, anybody want to join a, a, a group here of the Raffle Copter Appreciation Society? Um, you can trust us. It's perfectly safe. You can go and join it. And we won't screw with you at all. So um, if anybody has any questions, we're happy to take questions on any of this stuff. Um, any of the detailed questions for specific mitigation stuff, we'll probably leave to Chris because he can speak from the actual vendor's perspective that actually built them in. Any of the questions on some of the higher level research patterns, stuff like that, we're happy to take those either in the room or offline anytime. So thank you.